They may have the most passionate and loyal following of the rock era. This band, they were jamming their way to the highest echelons of live music. When in 1986, this legendary band's frontman nearly died. The future of the group was in serious jeopardy from there. But the singer recovered, and the group made a miraculous comeback with their first album in six years. It's led to their one and only hit song. You're going to be shocked when you realize that this all-time group only had one hit. They played uh, live to the most people in rock history, over 25 million, but they only had one top 40 hit. Coming up, the making of an unlikely anthem by the psychedelic road warriors from Palo Alto and the unheralded author, who was an indispensable part of the group, even though he never performed with them. The story's coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, professor of rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you've ever rushed the stage at a concert, you're going to dig this channel of daily nostalgia, music nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe below right now. Click the big red button. Click the bell so you always know when our stuff's coming out. Also, check us out on Patreon. That helps us do more interviews and keep it a daily show. By the way, we have some amazing interviews coming up. You're going to be shocked. Really excited. Stay tuned. So here's a fun rock and roll topic to discuss. Which band has the most ardent followers of the rock era? You think it's the Stones? Beatles? Zeppelin? Maybe Pink Floyd? U2? Metallica? My vote is for The Grateful Dead. Since the band originated in Palo Alto, California in 65, the Dead began their incredible run of touring for 30 consecutive years, performing between 100 to 150 shows a year. And, you know, during that span, there were many accounts of diehard Dead had seen the band hundreds of times. They've played to more people than any band in history. They've sold over 25 million records. But they only had one hit song. One hit song. Let's get into it. This is actually a really cool story. For many, going to a Grateful Dead concert was a pilgrimage, even a competition to attend as many shows as possible. That meant dropping out of a regimented society and immersing themselves in the colorful tie-dyed community of the Deadheads. I didn't stop going on tour. I would probably going more than for a little while, but. Basically, what could I do? I'd have to go become a nine to five person like everybody else. I'd have to go to work. Actually, one of the most famous deadheads is NBA Hall of Fame center Bill Walton. He reportedly has attended an astonishing 856 Grateful Dead concerts. But that's not counting the offshoot versions such as Dead and Company and Rat Dog. That's pretty cool. When asked about his deep love for the dead, Walton is effusive with his praise. Their message of hope, peace, love, teamwork, creativity, the dance, the vision, the purpose, the passion are all things that I believe in. Now, the band originated as the Warlocks in 65, but that name was quickly dropped in favor of the Grateful Dead. The formative lineup included Jerry Garcia, Bob Weir, Ron McKiernan, uh, Phil Lesh, and uh, Bill Kreutzmann. A fifth member of the group emerged a few years later when Garcia invited Robert Hunter to become an official part of the Grateful Dead. Although he worked with the band as a lyricist for well over two decades, Robert Hunter never performed with the Dead at all. Yet his contribution to the band was absolutely invaluable. Hunter wrote many of the most cherished Grateful Dead songs. You know, Dark Star, Casey Jones, Terrapin Station, and Truckin', just to name a few. He also authored the lyrics for the Grateful Dead's one and only pop hit, the surprise number nine smash from 1987, Touch of Grey. How it happened, really interesting. Robert Hunter was born in San Luis uh, Obispo, California. He spent much of his childhood in foster homes when his father abandoned his mother and left the family destitute. Hunter met Jerry Garcia at a production of the musical for Damn Yankees. That happened in 61. 
They were introduced to each other by Garcia's then girlfriend, who was actually Robert Hunter's ex flame. Uh, the two obviously had similar taste in women. They immediately hit it off with a musical kinship performing gigs together as Bob and Jerry. Uh, Hunter's bohemian lyrics helped build the rise of the Grateful Dead, mesmerizing millions of fans that adopted the band with cult-like fascination. The true deadheads know all about Robert Hunter, how vital he is to the legacy of the dead. But he's largely been an unsung hero beyond that community. I want to talk about him a little bit here. The songs that Robert Hunter composed resonated with Jerry Garcia. He had an uncanny emotional connection with the words, the expression, and the inspiration that Robert Hunter shared. Garcia adapted Hunter's music with remarkable authenticity and empathy as if it were a liberation of his own feelings, not the interpretation of another. Jerry explained his special bond with Robert very succinctly. He understands the way I think. Even though he got along just fine with the other members of the dead, Hunter didn't have the same chemistry with them. He tried collaborating on several occasions with uh, Bob Weir, for example, but it, it didn't click. It reminds me of the synthesis between, you know, Cream's Jack Bruce and lyricist Pete Brown. We talked about that before. Brown actually met Cream co-founder Ginger Baker first and attempted to write songs with him. But the union didn't gel like it did with Jack Bruce. Like I said, we profiled the Bruce Brown collaborative brilliance in several POR episodes. Uh, I'll link to some of those below. In the white room with black curtains. From 1982 through 1986, The Dead didn't really say any new music, uh, but the inspiration continued to flow through the mind of Robert Hunter, and his pen was more active than ever in the early 80s. He often jotted down ideas well into the wee hours of the night. Now, in one of those fateful late night sessions, this was back in uh, 1980, Robert Hunter, uh, sky high while devouring an eight ball of uh, cocaine, he stayed up all night. You know, racing with thoughts and frantically scribbling. When dawn arrived, he wrote the song Touch of Grey. As the sun came up, Hunter had snorted every grain of blow and was coming down hard from an all-night binge. The descending euphoria, it induced the unvanquished chorus of the song, I Will Survive. I will survive. What transpired with Touch of Grey was momentous for Hunter and the Grateful Dead, and actually Hunter never used cocaine ever again. The top 10 hit, it probably saved his life. Now, as we continue to break down Touch of Grey, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny I Wear the Glasses, that I always jam on here. You know, summer's coming up fast. It's almost here. And thank goodness, it's been a long winter. You got to get some sunglasses, and right now you can actually turn any Zenni frame into custom prescription sunglasses with the brand's wide variety of tinted lens options. Just click on the info button right up here to get up to 80% off regular retail prices, and you choose your pair today. Make sure to click on our link to get the best deal right here. So Robert Hunter's Sunrise Epiphany, that was intended to be a track actually for his solo album, a project that he was working on for six years. The original Robert Hunter version of Touch of Grey with Jerry Garcia and bassist John Kahn, uh, that was much slower than the definitive version uh, that The Dead put out. Garcia and Kahn, who was another trusted collaborator for Garcia, they were helping their friend with a recording of Touch of Grey, but it, it actually never got finished. Now, eventually, Jerry asked Robert if he was okay with the Grateful Dead giving the song a yeah, whirl. Robert was happy to oblige. He didn't mind Jerry making some alterations. Uh, one of them was he added the lyric, light a candle, curse the glare. So that actual passage paraphrased a statement that presidential candidate uh, Adlai Stevenson made about Eleanor Roosevelt when the former first lady passed away. Uh, in 1962. Stevenson's quote went something like this, she would rather light a candle than curse the darkness. She said that life was meant to be lived and curiosity to be kept alive. Jerry altered the tempo of Hunter's song as well, changing the rhythm from E to C sharp minor, along with some really cool flourishes. 
He also softened uh, Hunter's acerbic line in verse two. I see you got your list out, say your piece and kiss off to the more uh, congenial, say your piece and get out. Before recording the song for their forthcoming album at the Marin Veterans Memorial Auditorium in early 87, the Dead actually started playing Touch of Grey in their live set clear back in 1982. And the Deadheads, they enthusiastically dug the song until it became a hit song. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Since the Dead had been playing most of the tracks in their live shows, uh, they decided to record the core cuts for the album in a uh, darkened auditorium with no audience, hence the title of the album, In the Dark. Um, in the auditorium, they incorporated the same type of lighting used to illuminate the stage during their live shows. The idea was to create an atmosphere that would give the band the vibe they felt for the songs when they were performing them in front of live audiences. And then the audio was fed to a recording truck that was parked outside the venue and each band member played their parts together in real time. Touch of Grey's anthemic, I Will Survive Outcry, that became more than just a song lyric. It became a divine prophecy for the Grateful Dead. As the front man and lead vocalist for the Dead, Jerry Garcia was at the center of the band's historic fan devotion. While the Dead's popularity grew, so did uh, Jerry Garcia's mind-altering drug abuse. His health was constantly an issue, exacerbated in the 80s when he was diagnosed with diabetes. In July of 86, after the band played an outdoor concert in DC and during an oppressive heat wave, Jerry Garcia guzzled a large glass of fruit juice backstage and then he suddenly collapsed into a diabetic coma. Deadheads everywhere prayed to save his life. Now, Jerry Garcia, he defied the odds and he miraculously came out of this coma. He recalled having what he called very weird experiences while he was in this coma. Uh, he vividly recalled struggling with a futuristic spaceship battling aliens that looked like insects, is what he said. Uh, this near-death episode profoundly affected Jerry Garcia, mentally and physically. He had motor skill impairment, and it forced him to relearn how to play the guitar. He even had to train his body to do basic movements that we all take for granted. After onerous rehabilitation, Jerry worked his way back on stage as the transitional Jerry Garcia band. The dead waited patiently for the return of their leader, and they had a fantastic comeback on December 15, 1986. They kicked off three consecutive nights at the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum. They opened their comeback show with Touch of Grey, uh, a very poetic way to welcome the return of Jerry affectionately nicknamed Good Old Captain Trips. Fittingly, Touch of Grey, that was released as uh, the lead single from the album in July of 87, from this long-awaited Grateful Dead album, In the Dark. The song, it was an undeniable smash. Clive Davis, the inimitable president of Arista, he had a deep respect for the Grateful Dead, and he knew Touch of Grey had the potential to be the first universal hit for this band. So he actually issued a standing order that his promotion and marketing staff was to work the single harder than they ever worked a single before that time. Pretty cool when the record label gets behind it. Now on the flip side, the members of the Grateful Dead, they never cared about success of pop radio at all. Up to that point, the closest the band ever came to cracking the top 40 was actually trucking, stalled at number 64 in 1970. Like the man. The band learned that Touch of Grey had just broken the top 10. Uh, it actually happened just before they hit the stage for an engagement at the famed Madison Square Garden. The news was delivered actually by their publicist, Dennis McNally. McNally recalled that when he told the band about the song breaking into the top 10, <laughs> get this is what Jerry Garcia said. He responded, I'm appalled. It was a bittersweet moment for the Grateful Dead. They'd achieved something that they'd never dreamed about. It was both exciting and uncomfortable. However, they really didn't know what to make of it uh, in the long run or the short run. The innovative music video, though, directed by Justin Kreutzmann, that was heavily rotated on MTV, and it presented another medium that the band was not really accustomed to. 
Touch a Grey climbed to number nine on the Billboard Hot 100, number 15 on the Adult Contemporary chart, and topped the mainstream rock survey. They hit number one. Despite the fact that the band was uh, commanding more money than they could ever have imagined, in typical fashion, the Grateful Dead, they snubbed the song's popularity. They only performed the song in their live concerts when they felt like it, really. Not because of an obligation to play the hit, you know. Video is really cool too with the skeletons. I love that. You know, the dead, they didn't cater to the fans that discovered them because of the uh, Touch of Great video on MTV or, you know, they heard the song on their favorite radio station. Anyone who's ever been to a dead concert will tell you that every single one of their shows, completely different. They never wavered from that amazing tradition. That was one of the many aspects that made him such an endearing live act. If you saw the Grateful Dead once, you couldn't wait to see him again and again and again. Now, Touch of Grey, it rejuvenated the Grateful Dead. In interviews with the media, Weir, Lesh, Kreutzmann, and Garcia, they admitted the band was really struggling in the mid-80s. In the dark, the album, it generated a pivotal resurgence for this band, giving them a mainstream presence that they just never really had before that. Even though it was awkward territory for the great Jerry Garcia, his mental and physical condition continued to decline in 93 and into 94, and he actually relapsed into the inducement of heavy narcotics to deal with chronic pain. Uh, Jerry actually checked himself into the Betty Ford Clinic in July of 95, but he only stayed there for two weeks. He then entered the Serenity Knowles Treatment Center in Forest Knowles, California, uh, where he died in his room at the center on August 9th of 1995. And although he was only 53 years old, Jerry's body was ravaged by decades of drug addiction, smoking, and diabetes. The cause of death was actually classified as a heart attack. August 9th, 1995. Certainly one of the saddest days of the entire rock era. Not only did the date mark the death of one of the most impactful and beloved music icons, it was effectively the death of the Grateful Dead. And needless to say, it was a devastating time for deadheads and really the entire music industry. After the death of his dear friend and his collaborator, Robert Hunter continued to write, though, working with many other artists, such as Bob Dylan, Elvis Costello, and Bruce Hornsby. Robert stated that he truly felt that he and Jerry were just getting started. He said that they were gonna create a lot more music together. A year following Jerry's passing, Robert penned a powerful, heartwarming letter to Jerry that he hoped would find him somehow in the afterlife. Uh, the last paragraph of the letter was particularly moving to me. You've been gone a year now, and the boat is still afloat. Can we make it another year? What forms will it assume? It's all kind of exciting. They say a thousand years are only a twinkle in God's eye. Is that so? Missing you in a long time way. 23 years after writing that touching eulogy, Robert Hunter passed away in 2019 at the age of 78. He was the only non-performing member of the Grateful Dead that was inaugurated into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 94, with 11 other pivotal members of the group. Of course, a well-deserved honor for a lifetime of extraordinary lyricism by Robert Hunter. Touch of Grey was one of hundreds of inspired songs created by the renowned partnership of Hunter and Garcia. Uh, that union has to be recognized with other preeminent duos such as Lennon and McCartney, Jagger and Richards, Page and Plant, and on and on. You know, I got in an argument about a year ago with a, a multi-platinum artist about the Grateful Dead. He actually told that oft-repeated joke about the Grateful Dead, you know, what does a deadhead say when he runs out of pot? Boy, this band really sucks. After a good laugh from this artist and some of his bandmates, I said, yeah, that's an old joke. It's really not true. We proceeded to get into this 20 minute argument about the value of the music of the Grateful Dead and them as a band. It ended up with me saying, look, you might not appreciate the band or their music. That's fine because we all like what we like, but you can't say they suck. That's just ignorant. Jerry Garcia was a hell of a player. Robert Hunter was a hell of a lyricist. They're a great band. Then I played in one of my favorite Dead tracks, Fire on the Mountain, which you hadn't heard. Fire on the mountain. 
Then I played the Jerry Garcia solo from Bruce Hornsby's hit song, Across the River, because I knew that he liked Bruce Hornsby. And this artist said, wait, Jerry Garcia played that solo? I love that song. So I had a little vindication. You know, the Grateful Dead, they remind me of some pretty amazing lazy Saturday afternoons of helping my dad in his paint shop. They remind me of the smile that my dad had on his face when I got him this vintage dead shirt for his birthday one year. Or the last episode of one of my favorite TV shows that got canceled far too soon, Freaks and Geeks, that used their music as their send-off. It's a show I share with my own sons a few months back, and it set them on the path to listen to the Grateful Dead. There is a fountain. Ah, I cherish these musical moments. And for me, it started with actually their only hit, Touch of Grey, you know, from the cool music video I saw on MTV. This was after my dad had been playing them for years. But I didn't get it then. But I got it seeing that video. You know what, sometimes you have to have the hit song tug you into the entire catalog of a great band. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, Touch of Grey may have been the only pop hit for the dead, but in retrospect, Touch of Grey has much more timeless significance than a chart position in a trade publication. A Touch of Grey, it's a sign of aging. For some, it's a dreaded reminder of getting old. For others, a Touch of Grey is a symbol of a graceful evolution of endurance experience, and character, a manifestation of living. Aging is a big challenge in a youth-obsessed society, no question about that, especially in the entertainment business. Fame is fleeting, fortune is temporal, but the music of Robert Hunter, Jerry Garcia, and the Grateful Dead, it will survive. We will survive. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about Good old Captain Trips, Jerry Garcia, Robert Hunter, and the Grateful Dead. What are your memories of this song and this band? Let us know in the comments. Let's have a great discussion. Um, make sure to subscribe below if you like our content. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Check out our merch. Check out our Patreon. It's all about keeping the music alive. Till next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.